Gitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy. We are back in Miami for Bitcoin 2023, the world's largest gathering of Bitcoiners. And I happen to bump into one of them, none other than Gareth Soloway. Very good to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, always great to have you, Gareth. Of course, you are the uh, chief market strategist in the moneystocks.com and president of Verified investing.com and a fan favorite on Kitco. So saw you, had to pull you in for a quick interview. So Gareth, while we're here in Miami speaking, Fed Chair Jerome Powell is in Washington DC speaking and now moving the markets with his comments. He was talking at a monetary conference there. And he said that the stress in the banking system could mean that the Fed would have less work to do, that they won't have to raise interest rates as high otherwise to slow the economy because of the tightening credit in the banking system. Um, markets reacting to that. I'm going to read you his exact words here. Fed Chair Powell saying the financial stability tools to help calm conditions in the banking sector. Developments there are contributing to tighter credit conditions and are likely to weigh on economic growth, hiring and inflation. We're speaking on a panel for the monetary policy there. Um, he also said, interestingly enough, uh, that the Fed was committed to bringing inflation down to its 2% goal. Pretty consistent message from Powell there. And reiterate that point, saying failure to get inflation down would not only prolong the pain, but also increase ultimately the social costs of getting back price stability, causing even greater harm for family and businesses. So markets interpreting this uh, as a sign that uh, he's probably going to uh, keep rates as they are, but not hike them that aggressively. What does the interpretation of Gareth Soloway involve? <laughs> so, so you're right. So his comments were uh, he's on pause path, on the pause path. I think for me, the market has already anticipated that. To me, the biggest comment that he made was that they will wait until inflation comes significantly lower before even thinking about lowering rates. So, so I think the market, this is where the mispriced market is for me and why I remain bearish on the equity markets is that the market has this understanding that as soon as he pauses, it's one step away from cutting rates. And I don't think that's the case. And again, Jerome Powell has said this till he's blue in the face that he doesn't want to repeat the mistakes of Paul Volcker in the 80s, right? So to me, rates are not going down unless, like he said, unless we get inflation back in the bag, that's 2%. And I don't see that happening for at least a year or two even. But he's not necessarily saying anything new here in mm -hmm. terms of right, his uh, inflation target. I mean, he's been pretty consistent with trying to dissuade markets from expecting any kind of, of pivot. Right. The problem is the, the markets don't believe him. And there is good reason for that. There is. Considering, as I like to stress, this is the same Fed chair that told us inflation was transitory. Uh, gold rallying on this news, uh, and, and gold had been pulling back a little bit. What's your outlook there? What do you make of the gold react? So for me, gold, gold was due for a pullback. It hit that high from both 2022 and 2020, and that's known as a triple top in technical trading. And so you expect a pullback off of that. But for me, triple tops actually are the beginning stages of the next big breakout. And so I'm looking at this pullback in gold as a buying opportunity, and I do think within probably weeks, we could take out that high of around 2075 on gold. And I still have that year-end price target of 2300. So it's still going to make a new all-time high in 2300 uh, by the end of 2023. That's right. So if we do have Fed Chair Powell uh, and the Fed maybe pausing in June, I guess that's the consensus. And I think that would signal that what we've heard from him today. And not continuing to raise, but also not cutting what would that mean for the economy? Is that back to that stagflation forecast that you have, even though he did say he wants to continue to push on the inflation? Yeah, so it is back to the stagflation narrative. And I think that's the most likely near-term outlook over the next six to 12 months. Uh, we have a Fed that, again, likely won't be cutting rates to stimulate growth. They've already said that there'll be a mild recession. Again, just like you mentioned with him saying transitory, look at what we got. So I have very little confidence in the Fed that they actually know what the economy is going to ultimately do. And it puts us into a situation where inflation stays elevated. And I think people have to understand that you had two parts to inflation. We had the supply chain part, which has been solved. We're not really in that issue anymore, but we still have the higher wages. Wages jumped tremendously since COVID. 
And that's going to be an inflationary pressure that's going to keep inflation above, in my opinion, just above 3% for at least a year. Of course, the tightening of the credit took its toll on the banking sector, as we saw uh, with a number of banks. Uh, what we had three of the largest U.S. bank failures happening in March alone. And yet you are now saying you're long on the regional banks? Yes, that's correct. So, so the way I trade, and again, I'm a shorter term trader, but the way I look at it is, is you have things that have been beaten down to probably levels where it's a little overbeaten. And so if we just get some sort of relief rally, which is very likely in the banking sector, if things calm down a little bit, I think money flow heads back into them. And likewise, I'm actually short big cap tech. We've seen stocks like NVIDIA, uh, AMD, um, Tesla start to rip higher again, Microsoft. All these stocks are starting to behave like they were in 2021. And for me, that's a red flag. Just like when I see Pepe in the crypto markets and all these, these meme coins running crazy, to me, that's not investing, that's gambling. And gambling was a precursor to 1999, 2000 collapse, 2007, except maybe that was in the housing market, but it was still gambling with flipping people like regular people were flipping homes and they thought that was the easiest money to be made. What happened? We had the collapse in the financial crisis. And so in 2021, we saw that again and it led to the 2022 declines and now we're starting to see it again. And so for me, these are flashing warning signs where I start taking advantage on the short side of some of these mega cap tech plays that have gone up way too much looking for some sort of retrace. Sorting the mega tech, mega cap tech place, but along the regional banks, which is a, is a contrarian uh, yeah. position. A little hard with extra charts right now, but yeah. can you break down the level that you got into the KRE index and what at what level you would pull out and what would signal that to you? Yeah, so I got it a little earlier. I'm down on the position right now, but ultimately I do expect a significant bounce over the next couple of weeks. So it's really probably something where I'm not going to hold it into a recession. So as we get later in the year and I expect a recession, I won't be looking to keep that position because I do think it'll create more stress on the system with loans going bad. We know about commercial loans and all the craziness that we have there. But one of the confidence builders I have is that the Fed has very well, the government has very clearly shown that they will make depositors whole. And I think that's a confidence builder where people start to say, okay, I don't have to pull my money out of all these banks because if even if it does go under, my deposits are safe. And so that, that gives me confidence to kind of move into those positions while also taking a contrarian view on a recession, which should attack the big cap tech plays. Well, speaking of confidence, how much confidence do you have that uh, there will be resolution in Washington, D.C. regarding the debt ceiling? Because we had Republicans uh, and negotiations today. Obviously, there's been a big impasse there between Democrats and Republicans. What's your confidence level on a resolution there? So, so my confidence still remains better than 50% that they do come to a resolution. But every cycle we go through this, there's more kind of issues in the government. We have more people that are on the fringe sides of things that are more likely to push us towards default. So I think I think as a trader, as an investor, it's definitely something where when I see the VIX, the VIX is trading at ridiculous levels. No one's fearful. I start to nibble on a little bit on the VIX side to look for some upside in fear. What if we do hit that? It's almost like buying an option where if we did happen to have that, the VIX could soar and you could make a lot of money versus if it doesn't happen, it's already factored in. The VIX has very little downside to go. So, so there are ways to play this, but I would just say going with the, the debt ceiling issue, I do expect some resolution because I don't think any party wants to be blamed, but it is getting scarier. Every time we go through this and we have these fringe sides to each party, it gets scarier that they may just say, no, let's screw it. Let's just let this thing default. Well, we are at a Bitcoin conference, yes. so let's talk Bitcoin. <laughs> and let's talk Bitcoin regarding the debt ceiling, because there's okay. two scenarios there, right? Um, from a macro perspective, if there is a default, that would probably be a positive signal for Bitcoin. But also, if a resolution is reached, that would mean more money printing, right. which would also be a positive for Bitcoin. How are you reading that on the macro side? And I know you have your technical analysis side as well. So I think a default would be a positive, at least a near term positive for Bitcoin, right? It would, it would be just like when the banks began to fail and we saw Bitcoin really rocket to the upside. My issue with Bitcoin is that even when we had issues with some of the regionals where they were dropping 50% like two weeks ago, Bitcoin actually came down. And to me, that tells me Bitcoin doesn't know what it is yet. Is it a digital gold? Is it a risk asset? And so for, I'm in the camp that I think I think Bitcoin topped out at 30,500 recently, and I actually think we are going to head lower. I'm still in the camp that uh, 
that we're probably not making, we, no, we haven't made the bottom in, in Bitcoin you, yet. You've previously said that you do see Bitcoin dropping to 12 or 13,000. And if it drops uh, through that support line, then it could go as low as 9,000 yep. in 2023. Yeah, so 2023, maybe into 2024, the 9,000 okay. one. But I do think by year end, it's very possible we could see 12 to 13 or at least double bottom at 15.7. What would take Bitcoin then? That's going to be risk. It's going to be, it's going to be risk um, adjustment, meaning that de-risking in the system. It's, there's, again, Bitcoin is going through this crazy period where people are just gambling on these coins. And I, I've said this before, but I've never on seen- On the other coins. Yeah, on the other coins, but it, it, it's all the psychology of it, right? It's it's when people feel like they can gamble and they can just sell it to someone else higher and they know deep down there's no utility. That is not a sign of a bottom in a market, like a, bit, a Bitcoin bull market. It's a sign of a top. And so now if you, you expand that out and say, okay, Bitcoin is still a risk asset. Well, what if the stock market does start to tumble? where does Bitcoin go? And that's my thesis is that we will ha hit a recession. The market doesn't think that the Fed won't come to the rescue. The market and investors are conditioned for now 10, 15 years. Every time there's a hiccup, the Fed prints money. I don't think they do it this time. And that is going to be a shock. It's going to revalue the stock market 20, 30% lower from here. And that will take Bitcoin back down. In the sense of it's a fully unstable environment. It's dragging down right. everything. The parents have said, you get out of the house, you're on your own now to Bitcoin. Well, that's the Fed saying that to Bitcoin, right? I mean, it, it now has to stand on its own. It, there's no more money printing, at the least for the now. The Fed never really helps Bitcoin. That's for, for sure, well, directly, but the Fed the has printing. stepped to help the market. Right, you know, and it's the printing of money that ultimately yeah. helps Bitcoin. So you really think Powell is going to hold steady, continue to channel his inner, channel his inner Paul Volcker. Okay. I, I think... What, what I, support line? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think that the Fed intends, like in their mind, they're like, we have to be hard about this. We can't let it get away from us. And I think they'll try to hold out. But just like always, eventually the Fed will print. But we're talking about them holding out to such a level where the market doesn't expect this. Because again, look at 2018. We had the Fed begin to raise rates. The market dropped 20% in like six weeks. And the Fed started instantly to reverse. Yeah. And that's what the markets have come to. That's what they expect. Take the tantrums have yielded right. results. But that was when inflation was under 2%. Right. Yeah. So now this is the key and the market doesn't realize that yet. So what support line are you looking for Bitcoin to break to confirm your 12 to 13 uh, target? Yeah, so, so on our way down, there's a huge level around 23 to 24,000. If that breaks, you're he headed to the 15,700 level, which is your double bottom. And then if that breaks, your next stopping point would be 12 to 13. So I'm very much a trader in that I look at the levels on the charts. And if one level breaks, if support breaks, the likely target is your next support line. And if 12 breaks, nine? Yeah. And, and to me, nine is a very intriguing number because if the 10,000 will be max pain. And, and the markets, there's something about the markets and the psychology of the markets that it makes it so that the market wants to flush the most people out possible. And to me, where would that be? If you ever saw Bitcoin break 10, people would finally panic and throw up. Everyone says, oh, I'd buy a million, you know, Bitcoin or whatever. That's nonsense. Panic would set in, and that's usually where bottoms are made. But you're a long-term believer in Bitcoin, you, so you would be buying. Yeah, but oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I'm such a contrarian that I want to see, like, I start buying when panic. They say blood in the streets. That's the term. Yeah. When you see that, that's when you step up. Vice versa, when you see the gambling that's going on right now and the crazy moves in some of the stocks and cryptos, that's why I start to nibble on the short side. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. Always like to quote uh, the Oracle of Omaha on that one, Warren Buffett. So, and even in the blood of the street scenario, that's where you think gold comes in as the traditional safe haven store of value, and hence you have the 2300 uh, gold prediction for 20. Correct, yeah. Uh, what about silver? Silver's had a bit of a pullback. Mm -hmm. Silver's silver's pulled back quite a bit more than gold. In a weird way, that makes sense because it's also industrial, right? So so you have silver where it's there's, if we are do head towards a recession, silver won't be as in demand. Yeah. And so that portion is helping it pull back more. I still am long-term bullish on silver, very long-term bullish on gold, but that's why silver has pulled back. I think it's starting to get actually interesting to nibble on down here. Let's talk about short term again, because you're saying that the fact that Bitcoin has pulled back from that 30,000 to 500 high that it's reached uh, in this trading cycle 
is an indication that the S and P 500 and the Nasdaq yeah. may be rallying upward. Well, so this so this is the kicker, right? Is that we are seeing the Nasdaq rally and the S and P rally right now. But this is the amazing thing. This is where I get all giddy and excited because, <laughs> yeah. So so if you look historically, and this is what I do, right? It's it's looking historically at charts. When we topped out in 2021, Bitcoin topped out in November, right? Six weeks later, the S&P and the NASDAQ topped out. If you go back to 2017, we topped out in December in Bitcoin. And about six, four to six weeks later, we topped out on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. And so what you're looking at here is, in my opinion, the NASDAQ and S&P are rallying, but you're seeing that greed come in where, where I think in just the last week, Nvidia is up like 10, 15%, right? It's getting close to all time highs. That to me is the final push up. And ultimately, we're now at four weeks since Bitcoin topped. And so the idea is within four to six weeks, the S&P and NASDAQ should top. And now you're going to look for a flush. Top previous all-time highs or just top? No, just in this cycle. This cycle. Just like cycle. Bitcoin. Okay. Bitcoin didn't get back to all times. It just got to 30,500. But same thing here. We should start to see the next leg down, both in crypto, which has started, the S&P four to six weeks later, which is right now to the next two weeks. So Bitcoin is a leading indicator, yeah. if you will, for movement for the S&P 500 and NASDAQ? Absolutely. And it, it's a, it is an indicator, and, and I'll tell you why, is because people de-risk. When they start to get nervous, they sell their riskiest positions first, which is crypto. Then the next riskiest stocks, and then it goes down the chain. So it makes a lot of sense why Bitcoin would be a leader for telling us that the S&P would, would top out. Okay, well... Again, at the Bitcoin conference, um, we talked about this, that we're seeing less attendance than usual. Right. What does that tell you about market sentiment? Are you seeing people uh, pulling back from Bitcoin, as you just discussed, and it being translated into slightly lower attendance this year? Well, not slightly, quite a bit of a lower yeah. attendance this year than last year. Still admittedly, what, there are about 15,000 people at this year's? Yeah, it's still it's still big, and there's no doubt about it. And Thirty thousand lost. Yeah, and I think that that's twofold. So number one, we know we're still in a bear market in crypto. Number two, I think it speaks to the the economy, right? I mean, it, it's not cheap to come to these conferences, um, and I think people, you know, you have to pay for the hotel, you have to pay for the flight if you're not in the vicinity, and then you have to pay for the ticket. And so I think it also speaks to a, a an economy where last year people were coming out of COVID, right? They all wanted to take trips anyways. What better place to go than the Bitcoin conference in Miami? Well, now you're past that and people are having a little bit more trouble with money. What has been your other takeaway from the conference so far? I, I mean, I, I think just for the most part, it's, it's very cool to see all the innovation out there in the booths. And, and, and then of course you always see Michael Saylor making, making speeches and, and everything like that. So I think for the most part, it's it's bringing together people that have a vision of a future that has less government intervention. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very cool way to be. And I think I think that's one of the great things about these conferences. Well, certainly the idea of less government intervention has been a big theme uh, at this year's conference. We just heard from presidential candidate Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Yeah, was emphasizing the, the role of, of Bitcoin in a free and fair market. Um, a lot of talk about CBDCs at the mm -hmm. US conference, which we didn't have last year. It seems that that has sort of permeated the, the mainstream thinking, not that Bitcoin necessarily is mainstream thinking, but the fact that we have more and more people talking about CBDCs. Yeah. Uh, what's your read on that? So I, I think that the CBDC is coming. In fact, I think the Fed is purposely and the government's purposely withholding regulation so that the CBDC can get its foothold before institutions come in to the crypto markets, right? So we know that right now, there's so many institutions that probably want to get into crypto, but they, they, there's no regulation. They don't know what the rules are, and they're not going to put hard-earned investor money at risk until they have a firm framework. The government knows that, and the government, just like China did, and this is, this is key, and, and weirdly enough, we're following the China playbook. China banned Bitcoin, launched its CBDC, the digital yuan, and then is now allowing Bitcoin back in, right? Instead of banning it here, they're just not giving anyone regulation or guidance, making it so hard for companies to operate and so hard for bigger players to get involved until they launch that CBDC. Once that, I, I would almost bet on it that once that CBDC is launched and has a foothold, all of a sudden magically we'll get the regulation out there. Well, yeah, a lot of people in the crypto space have been saying that it's lack of regulation clarity by design uh -huh. intentionally to... Uh, create confusion which deters institutional investors and, and other big players as you just mentioned but interestingly enough um 
We spoke to Michael Saylor here on Kitco News, and one of the points that he made that has been echoed by some other people that we've had on the show is this idea that because a CBDC is so politically toxic, neither party is going to support it. So we may have gridlock in D.C., and it may actually be um, a, a positive, but there won't be uh, no Republican or very few Democrats are actually going to come out and support a CBDC. We're in Florida where yep. Governor DeSantis has banned a CBDC. So is there any thought of consolation in your mind that a politics will prevail mm. with politicians looking at their electability in the near term and will thwart a CBDC agenda in the U.S.? I don't think so. I think I, I think that you're right, that the politicians on both sides, it's like a toxic topic, so they don't want to cover it. But look up like FedNow. FedNow is something that's being launched. To me, that looks like July. It looks a lot like a CBDC, instant payments, you know, and like, and I think I think that's the bottom line is you're right. The, the Fed is going to try to backdoor this and no political party will want to touch it. But I ultimately do think that it is it is coming. Yeah, uh, Fed now many of people many are saying is laying the groundwork, the railways for a central bank digital currency. Uh, speaking of Bitcoin, um, and you said that there you're walking around, you're seeing a lot of innovation in the Bitcoin space. Are you looking at investing in the Bitcoin ecosystem beyond Bitcoin? Are there any uh, plays that retail investors can take that expose them to a growing Bitcoin ecosystem? So I am interested. I, I personally would also like to see a little bit more regulation and, and just so I know what I'm investing in, what the rules are. But I think that absolutely some of these other coins, uh, Polygon, for instance, uh, Polkadot, uh, Solana, I think, I think the technology is very interesting and what's being built on them. But right now, I, I per personally, I dabble in Bitcoin and Ethereum. That's all I'm willing to because, again, it's, it's about quantifying risk. As an investor, as a trader, I have to be able to quantify risk. And I don't, with the government being shady on this, I just can't do that. And what's your position on Ethereum right now? I think Ethereum is interesting. It's a little bit concerning to see the gas fees and spiking as much as they have because it makes it very expensive but to use, I should say. But but I think ultimately it's here to stay and, and I'm okay in investing in something like that. Speaking of fees and transaction fees, ordinals has also been a big point of uh, discussion here at the Bitcoin conference. And a reminder to our viewers that that is like the equivalent of an NFT oh. on the Bitcoin blockchain inscribed on a Satoshi, which is the smallest denomination of a Bitcoin. Uh, what's your position on ordinals? Wow, I, I don't know if I have a big position on it at this point. I do think it's fascinating and I love, like if there's one thing I'd say is I love to see how everything is branching off and, and going in these different directions. It, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, the, the split there is the some are saying that it's good for adoption. It shows that there's more utility to the Bitcoin blockchain. Michael Saylor takes that view. Uh, others are saying that it detracts from the purity of the Bitcoin mission, which is essentially to be sound money and to be uh, the gold and store value. And the transaction fees are more expensive and there's blockage in the system because of the, the ordinal. So that's a big topic of a debate at this year's uh, at this year's conference, and and again, just to jump in, I I prefer to to leave Bitcoin as the digital gold. Like I would I would say that if we want it to survive and thrive, it needs to keep that. There's plenty of other coins that have utility, and we can see that. But I, for me, it's like keep it as it is. It's pure right now. Once you start getting and meddling in it, I think that's a negative. Does that include a Bitcoin spot ETF in the sense that that would allow for? potentially more market manipulation, as we've seen with some other commodities, where the speculation is that with a, an ETF and a futures market, you can have more paper Bitcoin, for example, which would allow for more market manipulation. What is your thoughts on wanting or not wanting a, a Bitcoin spot ETF? I, I do want a spot ETF. I think that it opens the door to so many investors that are scared to have crypto accounts because they might get hacked or they might lose their Bitcoin. And I think that this would be a huge way for more individuals and even older people that maybe are too kind of iffy on it to put a little bit in their 401k and just tuck it away versus the way it is right now. So, so I think anything that draws in more people, yes, you'll draw in, you know, once you get an ETF, the spot ETF, it probably needs to have regulation too. So that means that you're going to have institutional money too. So there is problems with, with manipulation, but I think anytime you bring more people into a space, it probably hopefully helps. Okay. And Gareth, final thoughts. Uh, what is the biggest macro trend that you're watching 
right now. Mm-hmm. So, so inflation data for sure. We yeah. want to see inflation continuing to come down. The more it comes down, the more it potentially gives the Fed maneuverability. Right now, again, I would say that the Fed is very firm on wanting to see inflation back to 2% before they even think about lowering rates. Um, having said that, if we get in a nasty recession, do I think 2.5% would be fine for them? Yes. But right now, they can't tell the market that. Because if they tell the market that, guess where we're going? Right back to all-time highs. So they're going to play hardball. Uh, people have to expect that. Um, so I would personally remain bearish on the markets here. Um, and again, uh, you know, that's how I've positioned my portfolio. Firm focus on the Fed. Okay, Gareth, so nice to see you in person. Thank you. I'll have to find some time to check out some of the exhibits at this conference. I hear you uh, had some success with, with a, a basketball game down there. Oh, yeah. Ran and I played a little basketball game. It was a fun game. All right. I'll try (laughs) try myself away to check it out myself. But thank you for prying yourself away from the fun and making it up here for a quick interview. Always good to chat with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. And as always, thank you for watching Kitco. I'm Michelle McCory. Keep it right here. Kitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy.